In the quiet town of Yorktown, Virginia, tragedy struck on a seemingly ordinary day in April of 2022. 12-year-old Sean Doherty was found hanging from a swing set in the backyard of his family home. Sean, a bright and compassionate young boy, had a promising future ahead of him. He excelled academically, effortlessly maintaining straight A's. When Sean dies suddenly, the details surrounding his death are shrouded in mystery, leaving his loved ones in the community grappling for answers. I'm your host, Michael, and this is Strange and Unexplained. Sean's family appeared to be just like any other, nestled in the heart of this tight-knit community. His mother had remarried a man named Jared, who became Sean's stepfather. They formed a blended family, with Sean's elder sister, Maria, the two younger half-brothers, Ethan and Hunter. Ramona and Jared were both highly ranked officers in the Air Force. The family was preparing for another move, as military families often do. But this time was exciting. They were being sent to the iconic Pentagon. The family had recently come back from a vacation just a week ago where they'd gone on a Disney cruise. The experience was so much fun that they were already getting ready for another trip. They even renewed their passports in preparation for the August trip. Things seemed to be going great for Sean. However, on Thursday, April 14, 2022, everything would take a turn for the worse. Sean's mother, Ramona, was occupied for most of the day as she accompanied her mother, Sean's grandmother, to a doctor's appointment. Meanwhile, Sean's stepfather, Jared, was out with their second youngest son for an appointment as well. The oldest daughter, Maria, would be home later as she had a tennis match after school. So Sean was left at home to look after his two-year-old baby brother. His mother estimated that the errand would only take about 25 minutes, and Sean was a reliable young man and ready for the responsibility. Sean even managed to complete his homework while babysitting. He had a brief phone conversation with his mom, and then he started taking out the trash. At a little past 4.30, Maria rushed back home from her tennis match. She had to hurry because her boyfriend and his mother were going to pick her up soon for a lacrosse game. Now, she attempted to enter the house, but found that the door was locked. She knocked and rang the doorbell, but there was no response. Worried, she called and texted Sean, who was supposed to be babysitting inside. But there was no reply. Maria then phoned her mother to ask about Sean's whereabouts, and Ramona reassured her that he was probably engrossed in his video games and just couldn't hear her at the door. Maria decided to inspect the back door to see if it was unlocked. She made her way towards the backyard. However, the moment she entered, a wave of shock engulfed her. Her 12-year-old brother, Sean, was suspended from the swing set in the backyard, his arms and hands secured tightly by his side with a belt. With his feet touching the ground, he swung precariously, barefoot and vulnerable. A motorcycle helmet bag enveloped his head. The string firmly knotted around his face. Nearby on the ground lay his shattered glasses, Maria hurries towards her brother, desperately attempting to lift him up in order to alleviate the pressure on his head. Simultaneously, she reached out with her free hand to dial 911. Maria's account of the incident remains unchanged, with these vivid details forever etched into her mind. While awaiting for the arrival of the paramedics, Maria made a concerted effort to lower Sean, untie the string, and remove it from around his head. She then proceeded to perform CPR until the medical professionals arrived and took over. Sean was still restrained by the tightly fastened belt around his waist, which had rendered his arms immobilized by his sides. Paramedics were obliged to remove the belt in order to effectively administer shocks using the defibrillator. Sean was also found wearing clothing that would be identified as belonging to his stepfather, Jared. Now, upon her return from her appointment with her mother, Ramona was met with a disquieting sight in the front of her home. A swarm of police officers, an ambulance, and a fire truck. In the midst of the chaos, her heart sank as she noticed her visibly distressed daughter, Maria, and the frantic efforts of the medics attending to her son. Despite her desperate attempts to approach him, she was denied access by the medical personnel. Hurtling towards Maria, Ramona implored her to recount the events that had just unfolded, and without wasting a moment, they rushed into the house in search of their two-year-old. Once inside, Ramona says she discovered the child concealed beneath a mound of laundry on a chair and that he was acting odd, not like himself. Ramona dialed her husband, Jared, urgently notifying him about the situation and urging his swift return. Unfortunately, Jared was still approximately 40 minutes away. Sean was transported to the hospital by ambulance. Upon arrival, Ramona was told of her son's passing, and despite all efforts, he couldn't be revived. Now the concern loomed that something terrible, 
possibly even criminal, had occurred within the confines of their home, prompting the need for evidence collection, photography, and witness interviews. Regrettably, none of the neighbors possessed any valuable information to contribute. No one had witnessed or heard anything unusual emanating from Sean's residence. After searching the family's residence, the investigators completed their examination and cleared the home, allowing the family to finally return. Upon their arrival, the family immediately observed things which they considered peculiar around the home. For instance, on the kitchen counter, they found a bowl containing a peach, given the impression that Sean had started preparing a snack, but had abruptly halted. Furthermore, two tied-up trash bags were left on the floor alongside Sean's overturned Crocs, indicating that he had started taking out the trash, but inexplicably abandoned the tasks, leaving the items on the floor. They also noticed two torn garbage bags on the floor, which seemed different from the ones they usually used at home, as they had blue handles instead of the usual red handles. The temperature inside the house was set to 85 degrees Fahrenheit, or 29 degrees Celsius, which was unusually warm and higher than the family's usual preferred temperature. When the parents went upstairs, they came across Sean's underwear casually left on the floor in the master bedroom, right in front of Jared's open dresser drawers. It seemed as if Sean had changed into Jared's clothes and had left his underwear behind. Ramona couldn't decipher the significance of these findings, but decided to collect the underwear, intending to hand it over to the police for testing. Now, although Sean's jacket and flannel, which he had been wearing earlier, were discovered hanging in the closet, his t-shirt and shorts remained mysteriously missing. This raised the question of where were his clothes? They also found what appeared to be blood droplets and a noticeable handprint on the window of the back door. The handprint bore a distinctive film or residue, accentuating its presence. Family quickly alerted the police the next day, providing all the pertinent details. Subsequently, law enforcement returned to the scene with the intention of extracting the fingerprints from the handprint for further examination. Several weeks later, the lead investigator informed them that they had successfully obtained a clear print from the lifted handprint. However, Disappointingly, there were no matches found within the database. When the investigators returned a month later to collect additional prints, they reported that none of the lifted prints were suitable for testing. Family and surrounding neighborhood were scared that there might be a murderer lurking in the vicinity. But the shocking revelation of the autopsy results added to the nightmare. The medical examiner's office declared Sean's death as a suicide by hanging, much to the dismay of his family. The family, of course, found it hard to accept this verdict, as various factors seemed to indicate the involvement of another individual in Sean's demise. Primarily, they pointed out that Sean had no record of depression or suicidal tendencies, contrary to conflicting information that they had come across. Like the ER doctor who attended to Sean, he stated that Sean had a history of suicidal thoughts. Even so, the medical examiner's report negated any mention of depression or suicide. Now, the police interviewed Sean's family, friends, and classmates to investigate the possibility of bullying at school. Although Sean had a previous issue with a few students, it appeared to have been resolved. The investigators seized Sean's phone, iPad, and computer for examination, but found no evidence or relevant searches related to suicide. On the day of his death, Sean was in a positive mood and had spoken to his mother just an hour before his body was discovered. It is understandable for a parent to be hesitant to consider their child's unhappiness leading to suicide. Given the common misconception that suicidal individuals do not make future plans or exhibit warning signs. However, it is important to recognize that impulsive suicide is a genuine possibility and we can never truly understand what someone may be experiencing internally. There are several additional factors surrounding Sean's death they give me cause for concern. Firstly, his hands were bound to his sides with a tightly fastened belt. Maria described the belt as being so tightly secured that the paramedics had difficulty removing it from his body during their efforts to revive him. Also, the bag found on his head turned out to be a motorcycle helmet bag taken from their own garage. Now what about Sean's missing clothes? Sean's family does not accept the labeling of his death as suicide. They firmly believe that their child's death was hastily classified as a suicide and that numerous mistakes were made. This is entirely reasonable considering the suspicious circumstances surrounding Sean's passing. However, DNA testing on the rope only detected Sean's DNA. They did not find any evidence of an intruder or signs of sexual assault. Additionally, conflicting statements were provided by Sean's sister, Maria, and the police. Maria claimed that his feet were touching the ground when she found him, whereas the police stated that a chair had been moved from the deck to support Sean when he hung himself. The police explained that first responders moved the chair aside to carry out life-saving measures. Well, as of May 2023, 
the York Pocasson Sheriff's Office has officially closed its investigation into the death of 12-year-old Sean. The untimely loss of a child is an unimaginable tragedy that can deeply impact the lives of all those involved. The story of Sean's death serves as a heartbreaking reminder of how fragile life can be and how precious each moment shared with our loved ones truly is. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider supporting us on Patreon, patreon.com slash podcast, where for just three bucks a month, you can get access to our entire catalog of work and early releases of a lot of episodes. New episodes of Strange and Unexplained come out every Monday. So subscribe on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts for more. Until next time, be strange. Just don't be strangers. See ya.